Good afternoon, church. Good afternoon, good afternoon. I am excited to be here. I am excited to be here. Uh, I remember just as Uncle Mike was saying, uh, being a little kid, uh, first coming here in Plantation, was it 2006, Mom? 2000. Okay, so I was sick. Okay, yeah. Um, and it's so insane. Growing up here, many of you have seen me when I was really little, and it's crazy. Full circle. Coming back here and doing my internship here at my home church. Praise God. God is good. God is good. God is good. I want to take the moment to just say thank you to you all. Thank you to this church. Thank you, Plantation. Uh, I remember being at Southern, and they uh, were talking about, that's where I attend, Southern Adventist University, and they were talking about the internship program that they have going on um, and how it was coming up for this summer. And I was interested, of course, and they were like, hey, you can choose a church that you would like to do your internship at, but if there isn't a church that comes to mind, we can put you on one, you know, probably the Georgia Cumberland Conference, uh, or it doesn't matter. Um, I remember I was thinking, I was sitting there, I was thinking, I'm like, what church would I do my internship at? And I was thinking about certain churches down here in South Florida because I wanted to do my internship in the Florida conference. But it was so crazy how church after church was just going by and not once plantation came to my mind. <laughs> and it was like, duh, plantation, you know, my home church. And I remember hitting up Mr. Mozart, and I was like, hey, can we get this going, you know? And, uh, and because of Mr. Mozart, got the contact information for Dr. Pastor Rose, and, and we got it going, and here I am now. And it's, it's humbling, honestly. It's humbling to be here. It's an honor, and I'm grateful. So thank you. Thank you. Today we have a very powerful message, the power of unity, the power of unity. And attending church is not just a religious obligation, but it is essential for our, a spiritual, for our spiritual growth and our well-being. In today's society, many people, not just a little bit, but many people have, have been disconnected from the church. And here's the thing about this term, this uh, disconnect or this disconnection. When we think about it, a lot of the times our mind wanders to someone leaving the church. I don't know about you, but if when someone was to tell me that someone was disconnected from the church, the first thing I think about is that they left the church. But the fact of the matter is this. There are so many people who are still in the church, sitting in the pews, Sabbath after, Sabbath after Sabbath, disconnected from the church. There is this disconnection even though they attend church. And so I believe it's vital to understand the power of unity. Because there are various reasons on why someone may feel disconnected. Whether they're being mistreated whether somebody probably doesn't notice them. <laughs> or they feel like they have no purpose. They feel, like, they feel like there's no need for them to be here. But they're just trying to receive a blessing. Don't understand that they can be a blessing. There's so, many, there's so many reasons on why there may be this disconnection, even though they are in church. But I believe that so many people in the church have become disconnected because of lack of unity. Because the lack of unity. I just came back from a trip in South America. Uh, we, a group of us from Southern, we went on this mission trip and we went to the country of Paraguay to do an evangelistic series. And my professor, Dr. Gratterall, every night when we would come back to the hotel that we would stay at, he would always ask us, how was it? How was the sermon? How was the service? Was everything okay? What went wrong? And I remember one night, uh, my boy Evans, he came back from his service. And you know, he looked a little irritated or sad down, however you want to say it. 
And Dr. Grado asked him, what's wrong? Is, is everything okay? Was it good? How was the service? And Evan says how the service was good, but after service, I saw a lady sitting by herself in a pew, just by herself. And he went up to her, and he sat next to her, and asked her what's going on, how are you, your name, and whatnot. And she was honestly surprised, and she was shook by this, and, and she was happy that he was talking to her and asking her these certain questions, these certain questions. And, and he, he was shocked by her, her reaction, like, what's going on? Why are you so happy, you know? And, and, and she says how I've been at this church for months, for months, and not one person has come and had any type of conversation with me. Nobody. I've been sitting in the same spot, in the same pew for months. And nobody got the idea to come see me, greet me. You are the first person, and you're not even from this country. You are the first person to sit down next to me and to talk to me and to make me feel welcomed. I believe that there's power in unity. And I believe that it's something that is so crucial in the times that we are living in right now. Because, spoiler alert, the world is ending. If you haven't seen the news, if you, if you haven't seen what's going on in the world today, we are living in the end times. And Jesus is coming back to save us from this wretched world. And so if there's a time for us to be together, if there's a time for us to be united, to build each other up, to love one another, it's now. Let's pray. Father, you are so amazing. And we don't deserve you. But you see us worthy of your love anyway. Reveal yourself to us like never before right now. And Father, I'm taking a step back. May it be your words. And Father, if one person can walk out these double doors, changed, transformed, renewed, a fire that was put out, if it can be ignited once again, when they walk out those double doors, may your will be done. We love you, Father, and thank you for loving us. In your beautiful name, everybody says, amen, amen. Brothers and sisters, we must understand the importance of unity in the church. The Bible teaches us that unity is crucial for the health and growth of the church. We can accomplish great things for God's kingdom when we are united. And so let us open our hearts to the word of God and see what it says about unity. I want you guys to follow me to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. And today we're going to be a little, we're going to be doing a little bit of some passage hopping. I want to test y'all on your Bible. How much y'all know y'all Bible. So follow me to Acts chapter 2 verses 42 through 47. Acts chapter 2 verses 42 through 47. And once you're there, let me hear a beautiful amen. Amen, amen, amen. 42 through 47. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bed, bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through apostles. Now all who believed were together and, all, and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all, as anyone had need. So continuing daily, daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from one house to, the, to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. And so right here in this passage, we see the early Christian community, the early church. And, in, and this passage outlines four key activities that the believers devoted themselves to. The apostles' teaching, fellowship, 
breaking of bread, and prayer. And so we see an example of how the early church was united. They were united in these activities. See, by incorporating these practices into our churches, we can create a sense of unity and community that leads to growth and transformation. And so this passage shows us that when the early church was united, they experienced God's blessings. They shared the resources. They worshiped together and saw many people come to faith in Jesus. In Jesus. They witnessed the growth and salvation of many. They, not one person, but they together. They were believers who were united, not just in heart, but also in mind. They were a community of believers who loved and supported each other. This is an example that you and me need to follow, brothers and sisters. And in today's society, especially with Satan knowing that he is a loser, especially with Satan knowing that he already lost the battle. He is trying everything that he can in his power to divide us, to distract us, to bring so much turmoil within the church, to, to, to break us apart, and to not realize the promises of God. And so it's, it's, it's important for us to find ourselves following the examples of the early church, to be able to love one another and to support one another. And like I said, if there's a crucial time, it's now. Not tomorrow, not later, not your next New Year resolution. It's right now, church. And it gets even deeper. We can go to the book of 1 Corinthians. Follow me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm going to read from verse 20 to 26. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 20 to 26. Everybody with me? Amen. But it reads, now, But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet. I have no need of you. No, much rather those members of the body that seem weaker are, unnecess are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. But our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it. That there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. One another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. There are probably some of you in here right now that believe you have nothing to offer. There are probably some of you in here that believe that you have no purpose in this life. There's no way that you could be a part of, of, you probably think that there's no way that you could be a part of the body of Christ. You come to the church for a blessing, but do not believe you can be a blessing. But guess what, guess what brothers and sisters? Each one of us have a role to play. We all have a role to play. And we, we can look at the body parts. We can get deeper with it, right? There are some parts of the body that we feel like have no, probably have no use. Like, what's the appendix for? <laughs> it just messes us up. Why do I have to deal with an appendix? But I like to, I like to think of, of a certain ligament in the body called the ACL. It's such a small little ligament behind the knee. And you never, and the thing is too, it's not until we lose something or something breaks that we start to, that we start to appreciate it more. 
<laughs> we start to find ourselves being grateful. We start to find ourselves being grateful. I remember I, I was very athletic. My boy Marion could tell you. <laughs> All y'all could tell me, honestly. <laughs> you know, always playing basketball. You know, the first service I was talking to Uncle Dane and saying how when I was a little kid going to the park right there. Uh, Sunday mornings with my dad playing basketball all the time. And I always took my knees for granted. Because if some of you know, you know, some of you do know, I tore my ACL and I tore my meniscus. And man, it's insane how such a little ligament has such a vital role when it comes to the human body. Just like that, I'm not able to do all the things that I was able to do before. I'm very athletic, and I love going to the gym. I used to be able to squat 315 like nothing. Yeah. <laughs> now it's like 190. <laughs> you know? but, but, but there were some of you in here that's an ACL. <laughs> there were some of you in the church right now that's an ACL. You know, such a small ligament but such a vital role in the church, in the church. And I needed, I need the ACL to maneuver in a way that I would love to, to be able to jump as high. You know, now when I play basketball, I'm just, I'm just shoot. I just stay in the corner. I just wait for Marion to pass it to me. I don't get nowhere near rebounding. No way. <laughs> But listen, church, stay with me. But as our physical bodies need all our parts to function properly, the church also needs all its members to be united and to work together. Amen? And so we need to use our gifts and our talents, whatever they are, whatever they are, to serve each other. And when we do, we will be blessed. We will be blessed. Uh, the thing is, though, it's, there's a, it's a, it's, it can be hard for some people to figure out their role when there's so much division. It can be hard for some people to want to even be a part of the church and to be hands-on and to serve others when we're too busy bringing each other down. Stay with me. Stay with me. It's difficult. It's difficult when we find ourselves being controlled by Satan, allowing him to have a foothold on each and every single one of us. It's difficult to want and to, uh, to be willing to be a part of something bigger than us. When we do not want to follow Christ's example and instead want to lean on what we think is right, what we think is better, and, and, and what would be good for us? Selfishness floods the church. Pride floods the church. Evil floods the church. And that's just the truth. As the world is ending, each and every single day, when I look at many, many services and I look at many people, and even at myself sometimes, you begin to see how, how, we be, how we are starting to become numb to sin. We're starting to become numb to sin. Certain things don't have an effect on us anymore. And it's sad. But this is the reality that we live in. And it's so we are allowing Satan to break us apart when we should be united when, you, when we should be together, lifting each other up, helping each other. And if there's a time to do it, it is now, brothers and sisters. It is now. And so this, gets, so this, this leads me to the last passage. Follow me to Hebrews chapter 10, verses 20, chapter 10, verses 24 through, and 25. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25. And it says this, and I love this. I love this. It's so powerful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling 
of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. You and I need encouragement to not give up meeting together. And this passage reminds us that, that meeting together is essential for our growth as believers. As believers. Spurring each other on toward love and good deeds. When, when, when we are united, we can overcome division. When we, are, you know, when we are united, we can overcome strife. And there's so much of it in the church today. There's so much of it in the church today. And so, brothers and sisters, it's important for us to encourage each other and help each other grow in our faith. Especially when we see all the things that are happening in the world today. Satan is at work. We need to be at work too. Not by ourselves, but together. Together. We need to encourage each other. We need to be united in our purpose and, and vision for the church. And here's the thing. Unity is not always easy. It's not. We may have disagreements. We may have conflicts with one another. It will happen. It will happen. But I, I, I love to look at Jesus. I love to look at Jesus because even though he knew that he was coming down to a world where people would disagree with him, <laughs> where, where people will reject him, disrespect him, he still came and did something that I could never see myself doing ever. Dying for somebody like me. He did not allow the disagreement. He did not, he did not allow the rejection to push him away from doing what he had to do to save each and every single one of us. He didn't allow it. And so as believers, if we are to follow the example of Jesus Christ, why are we allowing these things to push us away from him? Why, why, are, we, why, are, we to, why are we allowing these things to push us away from being more like Jesus Christ? We can leave that to the world. But as believers, brothers and sisters, as Christians, we claim to be. We struggle with forgiveness. We struggle, we struggle with loving one another. This is not the time, church. This is not the time. People are hurting. People, people are longing for this. And we are supposed to be together, are supposed to be carrying out this word to the depths of the earth. But how? When we keep tearing each other apart. Stay with me. We keep tearing each other apart. And the work that God has sought out for us, little by little, it feels like as if it's becoming impossible. Because we are allowing Satan to have his way. Here's the thing. When we choose forgive, to, to forgive, when we choose to love, when we choose to work towards reconciliation, we can overcome any of the challenges. And we become stronger as a result. In Philippians chapter 2, Paul encourages us to have the same attitude as Christ who humbled himself and became obedient to death on the cross. And when we follow his example and put aside our interests, 
our desires, we can unite and accomplish great things for God's kingdom. For God's kingdom. We live in a very terrible world, brothers and sisters. I think just a few weeks ago, um, there was this thing in Boston called Satan Con. Satanists come together. Um, they have like a service. And this was the largest one that they had. Over 800 attendees. Satanists. This is the world we live in. And the world that we live in is not afraid to show us Satan. Not just show us Satan, but <laughs> to show us that it's okay to choose Satan. This is the world that we live in now. They're not afraid to hide it no more. They're not afraid <laughs> to exhort this, to reveal this to us. Satanists are literally gathering together in huge numbers and meeting with one another. This is the time for you and I to unite. This is the time where we are supposed to show unity like never before. It's right now, church. It's right now. Preaching in Paraguay in the past, you know, for two weeks, I was in I was in the one of the world's most dangerous prisons. There are thirty five guards to four thousand prisoners. Absolutely insane, actually. Um, prisoners are free. I, every other day, I probably seen somebody sniffing cocaine. You see dudes just chilling, spinning knives. On the fingers. My protection in the prison were prisoners. That's just the truth. They were prisoners. But there's a seven day Adventist church that's in the prison, and that's where I was preaching at. And two Sabbaths ago, they had baptism over 22. Prisoners gave their life to Christ and were baptized. Praise God. And they were doing testimonies afterwards. And one of the, one of the inmates, Javier, amazing God, he was giving his testimony and he was saying how when he first got locked up, his wife and his children didn't come see him. And he had nobody explaining how he felt lonely, felt like nobody loved him. Suicidal thoughts. But he was saying how one of the church leaders, who was also a prisoner in the Seventh-day Adventist church, came to him and invited him to come to church. And it was the best thing that he has ever done. He started to explain the, the brotherhood within the church and, and the thing is is this I meet these prisoners and, and some of them were cold blooded murderers I'm telling you they got numbers on their head and you meet them and, and, and I shake their hands or I hug them and they embrace you and you would never think for once not for once like there's no way that you experience a life leaving somebody's body and you were the cause of it. Because of how loving they are. How, how good they were to me. It's like there's no way you were a murderer. And the thing is, is that these prisoners have been given many reasons to give up. They have been given many reasons to just quit and to end their lives. To say, I don't want to go through this no more. And the thing is, if you saw this prison, oh Lord. If you saw this prison, it was absolutely disgusting. 
I can't imagine being there, sleeping there and being there for a day. Yes, I was walking in there and I was there preaching and stuff, but actually living there, I just can't imagine it. These dudes have been given reasons. But the bond that they have with one another, despite what they're going through, despite the, the world that may be against them, the bond that they have with one another, the unity that they show is probably one of the most beautiful things I have seen. Prisoners, literally family. And I, didn't, I, don't, I haven't experienced anything that most of them have gone through. And then I look at the church here. And some of us may not have gone through what they've gone through. For some of them, they may have an excuse to stop and to give up. But because they're together, so many reasons, but they have been given one reason to keep going. And it was Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, we don't have an excuse. We don't have an excuse. Look at the world we're living in. If there's a time to unite, there's a time to be together. It's right now. Why should we wait? Forgive. Love. Build each other up. We don't have time for destroying one another. People need the word. People need to be saved. And as believers... As Christians, we need to start with us. It starts with us. We need to start showing the love of Jesus Christ with one another. So it becomes so much easier when we go out into the world. And so if you're ready to take this action, I ask you to stand. Brothers and sisters, I ask you to get on your feet. Satan wants to destroy us. And that's a fact. He doesn't want us to be together. He'll try everything in his power to deceive us. To tell us that we're worthless. To tell us that nobody wants nothing good for us. Satan will try everything in his power To remove us away from the promises of Jesus Christ. But one day, brothers and sisters, our loving Savior is going to crack the sky. And he's going to save us from this evil, wretched world. And here's the thing. After everything that I've been through, after all the pain... After all the, all the hurt, I have to make it to the kingdom. I have to receive the reward of eternal life. Imagine going through all the things that you've been through just to miss out on the promise. How pathetic is that? That's embarrassing. But here's the thing. I don't want to go there alone. Mary, I want you to go there. Mom, O'Shea, Matt, sister. I want to be able to see all of your faces there. All of your faces there. But it's not possible when we're breaking each other apart. When we're allowing the characteristics of Satan to develop in our lives. So may it be today where we make the decision to follow Jesus Christ. May it be today when we take the action to forgive one another and love one another. Because we are stronger together, church. We are stronger together. 
Jesus is coming back. And we will be united with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen.